My brothers and sisters, this is a singularly exciting experience for me to be able to stand here and speak to you today. Most of the speaking that I do now throughout the world is to the corporate world and I teach in great and spacious buildings that are not dedicated and it's a real blessing quite frankly to be able to stand before you today in a dedicated building and share my testimony to you about some things that I have developed some strong feelings about. This is the first time I've ever been to Rexburg, Idaho. <laughs> I hope it's not my last. We had a wonderful tour of your campus. My brother Ken Howell and President Christensen has been bragging about this facility for the last year and I have to admit I was a bit skeptical until today. And having had the opportunity now of touring your campus and feeling of the spirit here, I've decided that this is probably one of the best kept secrets in the church. You have a wonderful blessing and opportunity to be here. I would just ask you today, <clears throat> brothers and sisters, if you would listen with the verifying power of the Spirit to what I have to say, and there are some things I would share that I think can make a difference. One of the primary functions of the Holy Ghost is to verify true and correct principles. My favorite experience or story that deals with this verifying power I discovered when I was in the mission field. As President Christensen mentioned, I had the opportunity of managing a mission for the church in California. This experience did not take place in my mission. It was just across the border in the Arcadia mission. It took place in one of the Burbank wards. This family, a part member family, was in that ward. Dad was not a member of the church. Mom and the children were. Dad was a great big guy, smoked a big cigar, had a gruff exterior, a little bit rough vocabulary. And because of the gruffness of this gentleman's exterior, the word was permeated throughout the bamboo wireless that all wards have, that you're not supposed to bug brother so-and-so about joining the church. I've discovered if you want to keep a secret from the saints, put it in a manual. <laughs> They'll never find it. On the other hand, if you want to get something out with great speed, leak it, and it goes with great speed. Well, the word was leaked into the war, don't bug this guy about joining the church. No one did for 20 years. He was active in the church, came many, to many meetings, never missed the ward function, especially fathers and sons outings. At fate was habit, while we were there, a new member family moved into the ward, and for some reason they did not get the word, you weren't supposed to bug brother so-and-so about joining the church. A fathers and sons outing came up and all the fathers were out sitting around the fire enjoying a fire this Friday evening. The sons were out doing what sons do at fathers and sons outings, destroying the countryside. <laughs> While they were enjoying the fire, this non-member fellow suddenly with great ceremony, and he always did this with ceremony because it made everyone nervous, he pulled from his jacket a cigar and began to light it with a burning ember from the fire. As he lit the cigar, the new member fellow, who had not been given the word, was sitting through the fire, saw the cigar being lighted, jumped out of his seat and said, I thought you were a member of the church. At which point, the brethren around the fire clutched at their hearts and began to study the ground with great interest. The man with the cigar took the cigar from his mouth and he said, No, I'm not a member, I'm smoking a cigar. Can't you see that? He said, yeah, I can see your cigar, but I've seen you at church the last several weeks. You obviously know the gospel's true, don't you? At which point the bishop clutched at his heart and began to <laughs> study the ground with great interest. And he said, nobody ever asked me that before. He said, well, I'm asking you. I've seen you in church all these weeks. You know the gospel's true. And then he had the temerity to say, isn't it about time you join the church? Will you join the church? The air was so thick now around the fire that no one could speak. The man put his cigar down, stood up to confront his adversary and said, I'll tell you what, friend, I have a quarter in my pocket. I'll flip that quarter. If it comes up tails, I won't join your church. 
If it comes up heads, I will. What do you think about that? The new member fellow said, I haven't got anything to lose. Flip your quarter. So he reached in his pocket, took a quarter out, flipped it into the night sky, caught the quarter, put it on his forearm. As this brother told the story himself, he said, you know, that night as I stood there in the fire, I lifted my hand and the quarter said, Tails, don't join the church. For the first time in some 20 years of semi-activity in the Mormon church, the Spirit spoke to me. And he said, the Spirit spoke to me as audibly as if it were standing next to me. And he said, the Spirit whispered in my ear and said, cheat. At which point he took the quarter off his arm, put it back in his pocket, and said, well, it's heads. I guess I'll have to join the church. Great, that new brother said. We'll do it tomorrow. They took him down the next day, baptized that man, and today he's one of the great rocks of the Burbank War. Now, I'm not going to suggest to you today that the Spirit will often tell you to cheat. <laughs> but what I would suggest to you, that in a very real, practical, and marvelous way, the Spirit is speaking to us every moment of our lives. And if we can maintain some sort of condition that we can respond to, recognize first, and then ultimately respond to those promptings, it's my testimony to you will be okay. Now what I'd really like to have you remember, is, may I just start with this statement? What we do depends upon how we feel about what we know. Would you reflect on that for a moment? What we do depends upon how we feel about what we know. In the sixth chapter of John, in verse 66, the Savior gathers his apostles about him. There was a great falling away now because of the persecution that had now started. Many were falling away and leaving the church. Couldn't take the heat. And so the Savior gathered his twelve about him and he leveled a question at them in verse 67 that raises the hair on my neck every time I think about it. In that verse he said, Will ye also go away? In essence he said, It's not as fun as it used to be, is it, brethren? They're not laying out parties for us anymore and ex excited about our coming into Jerusalem. They're trying to kill us now. It's not so much fun as it was a few months ago. Are you going to leave me too? I think this stunned the brethren. And Peter now stands for it. And I think on behalf of the brethren said, If we leave you, where do we go? You have the words of eternal life. And then in verse 69, he bears a magnificent testimony. And he says, And we know and are sure that thou art the living Christ, the Son of God. What a wonderful way to respond to that. The Savior's saying, Hey, you going to leave me too? Peter says, Huh? There's any place to go. We happen to know who you are. And because of that, we have to stick around to the end. And they did. They did that, young people, because they knew who he was. My message to you today is, you better know who he is. May I share with you the reason I feel so strongly about that? By sharing with you what happens to a missionary. Do we have any return missionaries here? <laughs> when a missionary is called into the mission field, we go through an interesting experience in the church called the Missionary Farewell. Anyone ever been to the Missionary Farewell? It's kind of a ceremony in the church, and the interesting thing about that meeting is in the first two or three rows, you have people sitting where they normally don't sit. You know, you go to Sac meeting, everybody has kind of their own part of the chapel. And on the missionary farewell, it's different. Right on the first two or three rows, you have everybody that had anything to do with that young man or young woman going on a mission. And during the prelude music to that meeting, you'll hear this conversation. An advisor will lean over to a primary teacher and say, Can you believe this? <laughs> John, or Sally, is going on a mission. No, I can't believe it. Look at him. He's got ears. Haven't seen those for years. 
And they're just kind of a little dumbfounded about this. Well, the meeting starts, and you know, we, the preliminaries are over, and Mom gets up and speaks for 40 minutes. This is Mom's meeting. That's okay. She's earned the right. John or Sally usually have five or six minutes at the end of the meeting. They bear a nervous testimony and disappear for two years or 18 months. At the end of the two years, we have another ceremony in the church. It's called a homecoming. Anyone ever been to a homecoming? <laughs> Same people sitting on the first two or three rows. John or Sally sitting up here now, they're different than when they left. The rose is out of their cheeks now. Little lines are starting to appear here. Maybe a little less hair, fatter or thinner. It's different for everybody, but they're different. And this group down here, the same conversation is going on. They're looking up there and saying, wow, look at the change. John or Sally is sitting up here and saying, boy, they haven't moved for two years. <laughs> This time when the meeting starts, John gets up and doesn't bear a nervous three or four minute testimony or Sally, they preach for 40 minutes. Bishop gets a little nervous because the next word's trying to get in. He has to pull him off the pulpit. Everybody walks out into the lobby of the chapel and they say, wow, the gospel has to be true. Can you believe the change that took place in the last two years? May I indicate to you today why the change, brothers and sisters? There's a wonderful scripture in the fifth chapter of Alma. If you ever want to feel like you, if you feel like you need a good chewing out, you're getting a little proud and lifted up, read the fifth chapter of Alma. It's the best chewing out you'll ever read. In the 14th verse of that chapter, Alma levies three questions. In fact, he levies a total of 35 questions at the people of Zarahemla in this chapter. I challenge you to find those 35 questions and ask yourself how you would respond to every one of them. In verse 14, he asks, Have you been spiritually born of God? Have you received his image in your countenances? Have you experienced this mighty change in your hearts? All of that happens to a missionary in the mission field. They go to the MTC, that's a sweet experience, and then they go to their missions, wherever that happens to be. The emotion that they experience in the first three weeks is abject terror. Happiness for the first three weeks is when no one's home. Why? Because they're a little afraid. They discover when they get out there that if I'm going to survive here in the mission field, I've got to have help from God. A help that, quite frankly, many of us in the mission field really hadn't tapped into before that experience. They discover very quickly that just because I was the captain of the football team makes no difference out here in the mission field. Just because I had four cheerleaders slitting their wrists for me back home doesn't make any difference out here. If I'm going to make it out here, I've got to have help from God. And then they discover how to get that help. My favorite story about the fear that we experienced in the mission field as told as a young man from Utah. A six eight, handsome kid called to Mexico. Went down to the MTC, did his best to learn the discussions in Spanish and at least the door approach. Arrived now in Mexico, his mission president met them. My wife and I learned a little poem when we used to meet our missionaries. And we'd whisper this poem as they got off the airplane. And the poem was, a diamond in the rough is a diamond sure enough. And before it ever sparkled, it was made of diamond stuff. But someone had to find it or it never would be found, and someone had to grind it or it never would be ground. But when it's found and when it's ground and when it's burnished bright, that diamond's everlastingly giving off its light. That was a very reassuring verse. We had some pretty rough stones arrive in our mission. But this missionary now is met by his mission president. They go through the orientation, and then he assigned him to his new senior companion. His senior companion was from Mexico, four feet 11. <laughs> As they went off into the sunlight, the mission president had visions of Mutt and Jeff doing missionary work together. Now, there is an unwritten law among all senior companions worldwide. I don't know how it got there. They don't teach it at the MTC, but it's there. And that is you take your new junior companion tracting the first day within the first hour. Why? Because they want to see blood fast. <laughs> and so his senior companion, doing his duty, took his new companion from Utah tracting. Knocked on three or four doors, took the first two or three doors so he felt his companion was ready. On about the fifth door, the senior companion knocked on the door, and they, all do this, they do this all the same. You'd think they went to school. This is what they do. Knock on the door, and then he stepped back, and he said, Your door, elder. 
This great big kid from Utah stood up absolutely terrified, trying to remember the approach in Spanish. The door swung open, a woman standing there chattering in fluent Spanish. He couldn't remember his name in Spanish. He stood there for 30 or 40 seconds, starting to sweat, absolutely dying. Nothing came. What was his companion doing? Nothing. <laughs> Enjoying the agony. At the end of 30 or 40 seconds, finally one line from the first discussion came into his mind in Spanish. With great sense of relief, he lifted his little companion up in front of him and said to the woman in fluent Spanish, This is my beloved son. Hear him. <laughs> Now, <laughs> what happens between the first door when there is all that fear and the last door? Two years later, that same missionary, elder or sister. And may I encourage you young ladies to seriously consider missions. Your president married a return missionary. So did I. They're great. At the end of two years, this same missionary knocks on the door and a new fear has developed. This time it's a fear that maybe someone won't be home. And when the door opens and whatever the language is that elder sister stands for it in the majesty and the power of having understood and discovered who they really are. Stand forward and say, my companion and I are representatives, agents of Jesus Christ. We've come a long way to share a pretty important message with you today. Can we do that? Before she has a chance to respond, they're in the living room bearing their testimony. What happened between the first door and the last door? Two celestial habits were mastered and a spiritual condition developed that caused miracles. The first habit was, brothers and sisters, they discovered they had to feast on the words of Christ every single day. In the 32nd chapter of first ne Second Nephi, Nephi tells us about feasting on the words of Christ every day. It's always fascinated me that he used the word feast. There is a difference between feasting and eating. Missionaries know the difference. Eating is when they cook for themselves. Feasting is when they go to a member's home for a dinner appointment. <laughs> feasting is stuffing, glutting, getting it all over you, taking time. That's what feasting is. And in the same verse in that chapter in Nephi, we're told why, because the words of Christ tell us all things what we should do. Not just church things, all things. And in the mission field, the missionaries master this wonderful habit. And for two hours every single day, if they're doing what they're supposed to, they are feasting upon the words of Christ. And they turn on a spigot and start to receive a flow of the Spirit through that study. The second wonderful habit they master, the second spigot they turn on, is they begin to pray like they have never prayed before. May I see a show of hands how many return missionaries we have? More than one. <laughs> this elder right here. Don't turn around. <laughs> Tell me your name. Steve Young. Any relation to the Steve Young? That's unfortunate. <laughs> no. You'll always have food. <laughs> Steve, can you remember back to your mission? On an average day, how often would you, and all of you return missionaries, answer this in your mind. On an average day, how often would you and your companion kneel together in formal prayer? Kneeling prayer, how often in an average day would you say? All together. From the time you get up to the time you go to bed, how many times do you think you're on your knees? Eight plus. That's an average, folks. Eight times a day on your knees? That's the formal prayer. That's kneeling formal prayer. That doesn't count every time they're getting on their bikes in Sepulveda Boulevard and they're praying for life. <laughs> That's the formal stuff. You cannot get on your knees seven, eight, nine times a day with a companion for two solid years and not have a tremendous change in your lives. You can't feast on the words of Christ for two hours every day for two years and not have change occur. Conversion, by definition, means to change. Why does the missionary change? Because they turn those two spigots on. They discover they've got to have it. 
Well, then miracles happen around missionaries. One of the sweet experiences of a mission president is the day before a missionary goes home, we got to interview these wonderful young people. I don't believe there's anything more excited, excited than a missionary 24 hours before they go home. Why? Because they have discovered there really is life after a mission. They haven't been convinced of that the first year. In that interview, I'd sit with my missionaries and we'd kind of look at each other and we'd reminisce a little and then I'd ask them two questions. First question was, when you get home, are you going to continue to feast on the words of Christ like you did here in the mission field every day? And they'd look at me as if I were a leper. And they'd say, well, what do you, of course. Why, why would I stop that? No, I just thought I'd ask. You going to do it? Sure. Then I'd raise my hand. Promise? You want me to raise my hand? Yeah, I want you to raise your hand. Yeah, I, I promise. Then I'd ask him the second question. You're going to continue to pray often on your knees every day like you did in the mission field when you get back home? Then they were really blown away. They say, President Smith, if there is anything I've learned in the mission field, you have to talk to the Lord often every single day. I said, yeah, but I want to know if you're going to do it when you get home. You can count on me. Promise? Want me to raise my hands again? Yeah, I promise. Then they go home. Interesting thing happens when some of us get home. Instead of feasting on the words of Christ for two hours every day, it's 20 minutes before priesthood on Sunday if I have a lesson to prepare. However, that return missionary carries the scriptures. Why? Because they're all marked up. And they have that lovely young lady with them in church, and they open the book, and they sort of just, you know, have a look at that. Boy, that's really marked up, isn't it? <laughs> None of the ink is wet. But it's kind of impressive. I marked my book all up. Then instead of praying four, five, six times a day on their knees, it's once before we go to bed at night, if it's not too cold in the room. And we start turning the spigots down. And instead of a full, steady flow of that spirit that they basked in for those two years, a drip occurs. And then you hear returned missionaries say things like, Boy, I miss the spirit in the mission. Or they say things like, boy, that transition of coming back into the world was tough. If I hear either one of those, a red flag goes up in my mind nine feet high. I was in the Atlanta airport a couple of years ago. Young man, obviously, returned missionary, they glow. At least for the first couple of years, they glow. This young missionary was glowing. Walked over to him, established the fact that we were both members of the church, and we were talking about the mission. And then he said, you know, I really miss the spirit in the mission. I grabbed him by the tie, pulled him over, I think I've earned the right to do this. And I said, why, Elder, what aren't you doing now that you did in the mission field that earned the right in the first place? Are you feasting on the words of Christ every single day like you did in the mission field? Are you praying five, six, seven times a day like you did in the mission field? You know what he said? Well, sort of. <laughs> you know what sort of means in the Mormon church? It means I haven't done it for months. I said, I guess you and I don't have a lot to talk about. He said, you know, we really don't. In every case, I've kept track of the missionaries that I labored with, over 600. In every case, those that are struggling in school, getting and keeping jobs, getting married and staying married. In every case, those that are having the struggles have cut back on those two magic, wonderful habits. They're not praying often anymore. They're not kneeling with their companions. They're not feasting on the words of Christ and getting that input every day. Not staying in spiritual condition. And then when the crisis comes, there is no muscle. Boy, brothers and sisters, I'm really serious about the impact that staying in condition has. Now let me tell you why I feel so strongly about the testimony. Tell you a couple of experiences of what happens when we don't and what happens when we do. When I was a junior in high school, I was raised in the Hawaiian Islands. When I was a junior in high school, I spent the year in New York City. At the end of that year, my family went back to Hawaii. I stayed there with a very dear friend. That particular summer was not one of my stellar summers of activity in the church. We were working for a yacht club and we thought we were pretty neat. In fact, we were pretty sure that we were the absolute ultimate. We were coming home one night. This fellow is a brilliant young man. He's graduated since from Cornell University in oceanography. A very bright guy. He has his PhD in that discipline in uh, Rhode Island now. 
As we were jogging home, we jogged home every night about two miles. As we were jogging home, it was about quarter to twelve, we started talking about religion. As we did so, he said, you know, he told me all about his church. I can't remember which church it was. It doesn't make any difference now. But when we got to his home, he said, you know, religion's okay for kids and old people. But he said, man, we don't need it. We're so slick. We don't need it. And they said, you're a Mormon, right? I said, yeah, I'm a Mormon. He said, tell me about the Mormons. Well, we were in his room at this point, and we were sitting down, and I began to tell him my story. And as I told him the story, I found myself starting to go through some very interesting chemical changes. The sweat. I realized what I was going to have to tell him. I said, well, you know, there's this kid who's in, living in New York, and there we were in New York, not far from where it took place. He wanted to know what church he used to join. There are all these churches in his area, and they all want, you know, he's trying to get him to join the church. He didn't know which one he ought to join. There's reading the Bible one day, and the Bible says, you know, if you want to know about this kind of stuff, you got to pray about it. I had no idea where it was in the Bible. So he went out to a forest by his father's farm and, uh, you know, he decided to give it a shot. So he knelt down and he, uh, you know, he started to pray. And as he was praying, uh, this uh, big light comes into the forest. And uh, as I said that, this kid's eyes got about that big. And I said that, you know, this light comes down in the forest, and he looks into this light, and there are two people standing in the light. And Artie said, is that right? Who was it? And I said, well, actually, it was uh, God and Jesus Christ. He said, is that right? You mean they've been to New York? You know, I'd never quite thought about it like that before. I said, well, yeah, you know, I guess they have. And he was obviously blown away by this, so I got off that and talked about pioneers in Utah and ended my story. His eyes never went back to their normal size. I ended my story, and he looked at me, and he said, Hiram, you really believe that? And I remember my conditioned response, the one that I was raised with, the one I wanted to say was, come on, what do you mean do I believe that? Me, Hiram Smith, not believe that? Come on. Couldn't say it to him. I had to look him in the eye and say, you know, Artie, nobody ever asked me that before, and I'm not really sure I can say for sure for me that that's true. His eyes went back to their normal size, and he said, man, I'm sure glad. That's the wildest story I've ever heard. And then he rolled over and went to sleep. Then I laid there, wide awake. I listened to myself tell that story again. Fourteen-year-old boy, forest, lights in the forest, people standing in the lights. You really believe that? The next morning, I think I slept that night. The next morning, I wanted to know so bad I could taste it. I said to myself, Hiram, only two possibilities. Either it happened or it didn't happen. If it didn't happen, your family's been messed up for a long, long time. <laughs> if it did happen, that's the most incredible thing that's happened since the Savior came the first time. I started to do those two things like I had never done them before. I feasted on the words of Christ, started to pray. I'd never really prayed for me before. I had all the Mormon prayers memorized. <laughs> after a season and how long is immaterial I started feeling pretty good about what I was feeling inside I started to feel about what I knew went on a mission, felt good enough about it got stronger, labored under a wonderful human being and Elder Hanks taught me about the Savior several years later I made a trip back to New York special trip, sat down with Artie Gaines over dinner, said Artie remember that story I told you several years ago about the kid and the lights people standing in the lights yeah, I remember that story it's true it really happened his eyes didn't get big this time, he just kind of looked at me he says, you really believe that don't I? I said yeah I do I said Artie there are only two possibilities either it happened or it didn't happen would you buy that? I said yeah I'd have to buy that I said, as a son of God, assume for a moment that it really happened. Does that mean anything to you? In the most sobering experience I ever had with that friend, and we are still like brothers, he said, Hiram, if that's true, that's the most important event since the Savior was born himself the first time. I said, and he believed that the first time. I said, well, I think you better find out, because it's true. Well, brothers and sisters, we each here today likely have experienced those feelings. We know that the gospel is true. The next question that Alma asked, back in that same fifth chapter of Alma, in verse 26, he said to the people of Zarahemla, if you have experienced this song of redeeming love in your heart, if you've experienced all these good feelings, you've had the spigots wide open and felt that flow of the Spirit, then in the last sentence of verse 26, he levels a question at them that blows them away. He said, I would ask, 
Can ye feel so now? I would ask you young people here at Ricks College, if you've experienced those feelings, are you in condition now that you can still feel them? If not, what aren't you doing? The Lord needs you to be in condition. When I was called on my first mission, I mean, I was, got home from my first mission. I was drafted, got in the military, went down to a place called Fort Polk. Fort Polk is where the world will end. They take your hair away, give you a green uniform. That was grim those days. I had some hair to lose. I was put into a barracks. Barracks is a grim existence. You have beds coming out from the wall, big center aisle, 60 kids, normally 40, but because of the Vietnam War, they're putting 60 into this room. I was assigned to the top bunk down in the far corner. 10.30 the first night, I was getting ready for bed. I was about to climb up into my bunk. Something said, Elder Smith, it's time to pray on your knees. I said to myself almost audibly, come on, you've got to be joking. Nobody's praying around here. And I looked around, nobody else was praying. And then I said to myself, besides that, it's awful difficult to kneel from the top bunk. Finally, after five or six minutes, Elder Smith won. Get on your knees and pray. The fellow underneath me had already gone to bed, tapped on his shoulder. Do you mind if I use your bed to say my prayers? <laughs> he looked at me like I were unclean. He said, what? I said, I'd like to use the end of your bed to say my prayers. Would you mind? He said, oh, no, no, that's fine. Go right ahead. And he got up and he left. Don't understand why he left. He didn't want to be there while I desecrated his bed. So I knelt down and said my prayers. I could feel within a four or five bed radius people doing this. <laughs> Got up and went to bed. The next morning I was named the Reverend. And I was known as the Reverend through my entire military career. Developed a little ceremony with this fellow underneath me. I'd tap him on the shoulder each night. He'd get up and leave and I'd say my prayers. The fellow in the bunk right next to mine. Remember now, bunks were close. This fellow was 6'4", six, 6'5", six, weighed about 280 pounds. He was from Kentucky. No fat on this kid. His shirt fit like a loose sunburn. He had a foul mouth and because of his stature pretty much got what he wanted. We were out on about three days into this. We were on one of our training ranges. He came up and he said, Reverend, I got to talk to you. What do you need, Osmond? He said, I've been watching you pray the last couple nights. I want you to pray for me. Would you do that? I remember thinking to myself, being smart enough not to say, boy, if anybody needs praying for, you need it. So that night, about 10 o'clock, he was sitting on his bed. He reminded me, remember, you're going to pray for me tonight. That's right. That night when I knelt down, God bless Osmond. <laughs> Next day, we're on the range again. Came up to me again. Reverend, I've been watching you pray the last couple nights. Isn't it a little noisy in there when you pray? I said, yeah, why? He said, I don't think I like that. <laughs> I said, oh, and he said, yeah, when you get ready to pray tonight, let me know. I sort of drove that out of my mind the rest of the day. About 10.30 that night, I was getting ready for bed. He's sitting on the edge of his bed in his shorts and his t-shirt. You ready to pray, Reverend? I said, yeah, why? Fine. Jumped down off his bed, got out in the center aisle, addressed the 60 other guys in that room, started with seven of the foulest words you can imagine, and he said, I want it quiet in here. It got quiet fast. Everybody walked out to the end of their bunks absolute hushed silence. He said, I want it quiet in here while the reverend prays. And then he looked at me and he said, pray. <laughs> there wasn't anything else to do at that point, so I knelt in perfect silence, said my prayers. <laughs> this went on for eight weeks. I couldn't go to bed without praying if I'd wanted to. One night I had to... <laughs> One night I had to pray wet. I was in the shower. He had everybody standing at attention. I had to come up and pray. The last day of basic training. The reason I share this experience with you young people, the last day of basic training. We went through our military parade. You know, they give you a badge. I got a, sharp, a sharpshooter's badge because I could hit a target with 3,000 rounds of a machine gun. <laughs> I destroyed a hillside. They gave me a marksmanship badge. At the end of this parade, before we went to our different assignments, I discovered that there were 17 LDS kids on my floor. All 17 of them active in the church to the day they came in the army. Most of them had lost their virtue in a pit outside the fort called Leesville, Louisiana. Most of them were drinking and or smoking. Most of them had acquired the military vocabulary of foul mouth. I found out one at a time, 17 times in a four hour period, they'd come up to me and say, Reverend, there's something you need to know. What's that? I'm LDS too. You are? Yeah. I'm very proud of it today but I wanted you to know. 
I had to ride a bus from there to Jacksonville, Mississippi, to my next duty station. I found myself weeping on the bus. And I said to myself, why? What happened to these guys? The answer is simple, young people. The message from the military is the message from the world. The message from the world is the message from lots of the other universities out there. The corporate world and the message is, if you want to be happy here, you better do what we do. You better think the way we think. You better act the way we act. Talk the way we talk. And I'll tell you what, friend, if you don't do that, we're going to make it real uncomfortable for you here. And they caved in. There's going to be a test coming, young people, when somebody's going to stand you up and say, you really believe that? Come on. Mormons? If you've taken the time to stay in condition, you know who God is. You've developed the feelings for what you know. Suddenly then what you do is will be directed by what you know. I bear my witness to you that the gospel of Jesus Christ is true. Jesus lives. He stands at the citadel of this universe, of this church. He knows everybody in the room by name. And he is pleading with you to maintain that spiritual condition so that the promptings can get through and direct you to do what you've been sent here to do. You are a magnificent generation. You've been sent here to perform miracles. It is my prayer that you may do that. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.